Hello everybody, I'm the Neon Hunter, and welcome to the film Fan Theories Iceberg Explained. So, I've basically been looking through loads of icebergs, loads of Iceberg Explained videos, particularly, you know, conspiracy theories ones, just all sorts, disturbing, creepy ones, you know, unexplained mysteries, loads of stuff, loads of different icebergs, and I've not seen one on the film Fan Theories uh, Iceberg. I've seen film ones, disturbing film ones, but I've not seen a film fan theories one um, explaining them. I know some people like Maker, he was going to do one. Uh, there was one on his poll um, that he did recently, or poll that he did recently on his community tab. <clears throat> and I just thought I could do one, you know, because I love films, as you guys know. Um, and it's just fun just fun i love these kind of videos and i want uh you know people to be able to watch a video about film fan theories basically in an iceberg video because i love iceberg videos and i've been really enjoying them so here we are darth jar jar now this theory basically posits that jar jar binks from the prequel trilogy uh, of star wars is a sith lord and was a sith lord all, all along and basically undercover like an undercover agent um lots of people have said this is the case because it just doesn't make any sense why he's so acrobatic and nimble and good uh at fighting um and how he's so close to the to the jedi and why really like it doesn't really make much sense if you think about it um and even you know liam neeson has said that uh jar jar did go to the dark side that's that's a quote from him and the guy who actually played uh jar jar himself ahmed best who actually got a lot of abuse which is fucking horrible uh he actually said i will th say this it feels really good when the hid hidden meaning behind work is seen um when asked about the theory so this is basically confirmed i mean i kind of see it as confirmed especially if liam neeson later really said that he went to the dark side i mean you can't really get to like much closer than that right so yeah it's a good one james bond is a code name so this one is pretty self-explanatory uh it essentially theorizes that james bond isn't his real name um and is simply an alias that 007 uses even though 007 is clearly his code name do you know what i mean um like, why would he need two code names if he's already got one and it's a number? I mean, there doesn't it doesn't get more cryptic than a number, right? Um, it's also been debunked because in Skyfall, you can actually see his parents' gravestones, uh, which they actually have the last, main, last name uh, Bond. So, I mean, why would they have code names too? So it's basically been debunked already. But it's an interesting one. I mean... It kind of sounds like a code name, and given the fact that you know so many car uh, actors have played him, I can understand that. But then again, so many actors have played 007, and I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not a big Bond fan in terms of like all the films. I love Skyfall, but um, I think I don't. I'm not sure if all of them were actually called James Bond, uh, because you know all of them were. I think all of them were referred to as 007. But I'm not sure if every one, every one of them use James Bond uh, as as their name. So that that I think is more consistent than James Bond being used, at least from my speculation, because uh, I think 007 was used more. Could be wrong, but yeah, this is basically being debunked anyway. Um, yeah, every Disney film is connected. Now there's basically two: the Pixar theory and the uh, every. Disney films connected they're basically the same th exact thing so I think I'll just cover this now it basically just says that the Pixar theory is that every Pixar film is uh connected in the same world and every Disney film is connected says the same thing just with Disney films and basically you know Pixar and Disney have lots of different corporations lots of different brand names uh, locations that have been used in the same film like for example i think in monsters inc you can see bnl is used in monsters inc yeah bnl shows up in toy story 3 and monsters inc uh in multiple of them 
I think the arcade from Toy Story 2 is also, uh, uh, that, the name of that arcade is also used in other, uh, films from what I remember, um, and also in, like, uh, The Hunchback, I think in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, you know, Bella, I think, from Beauty and the Beast is in that, uh, stuff like that, basically, I might be, I might be wrong about that, um, but basically, you know, there's just so many of them that it's, like, hard to just list them all off, and it's just kind of, like, there's no point in listing them all off because it's kind of just true at this point because it's so, like, not subtle, but it's an interesting one, it's a really interesting one to think, like, all those characters coexist, you know, like, Nemo's knocking around when, uh, Woody's hanging out or whatever, uh, Buzz Lightyear, um, and yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one, and, I mean, it's basically, it's basically, conf in my mind, it's, it's my, you know, it's kind of canon in my mind, because just so, there's so many connections in both Disney and Pixar, I'm not sure if Pixar and Disney have, uh, coexisted in the same world, because obviously the Disney universe is different from the Pixar universe, um, but this doesn't cover that. This covers dis the the two the Pixar theory and every D Disney film is connected. Not Pixar and Disney live in the same world, so I don't think they're referring to that. But nonetheless, very interesting, very cool. The Shining shows that Kubrick faked the moon landing. So this one is probably like the most popular uh, theory, film fan theory like of all time. I'd say you know it's kind of a meme at this point in in just society you know oh kubrick did the moon landing just because he did 2001 and it was incredibly impressive for the time that instantly means he did the fucking moon landing it doesn't make any sense um but people think that it does because you know room 237 in uh the shining represents 237,000 miles uh f the moon is 237,000 miles from the earth uh, at the time that they made that, I think it's actually higher now, and basically, you know, uh, there's a part where, uh, of, well, there's the infamous part where, um, Jack, uh, the character, not Jack Nicholson, well, technically both, but he's, uh, in his peak of insanity, uh, at the, at the hotel, at, is it, I think it's called the Outlook Hotel, I haven't seen it for a while, I've, I love Kubrick, but I haven't seen it in a while, people think that because uh he's he writes uh all work and no play makes jack a dull boy the all <laughs> this is fucking crazy the all a l l means apollo 11 <laughs> which i think uh <laughs> i just love that one because it's the most it's the most uh obscure thing uh ever um and the the reason they think he did it through the shining is because he felt so guilty but he knew if he owned up to it he would be in deep duty with the cia and everything the government and but he just felt so much guilt that he needed to admit it in some way so he did it through the shining um i think it's a really good one uh, but also like why did he wait so long to to do it you know what i mean like why did he wait until uh like because the moon landing was 1969 and i think uh 2001 came came after the moon landing or is it 1968 was 2001 but i don't understand why let's have a look here so he had made yeah he had made you know a clockwork orange barry linden films like that like two films before and like going oh, i feel really guilty about this so it, it you know why didn't he feel guilty straight away and why did it take him so long to admit it and like do you know what i mean like surely you would feel guilty straight after it wouldn't go maybe it taxed on his mind for long enough but you know, it just doesn't make any sense, you know, that he made A Cocker Corns yet and Barry Lyndon two films um, before The Shining, which would be the ultimate, you know, admit admittance that he did do it uh, by by the this theory standards. But interesting one. Don't believe it. 
but it's an interesting one nonetheless. The merchant is the genie. So this one is basically saying that the merchant in Aladdin is the genie, like a manifestation of him, a physical version of him. Um, and this one has been confirmed by the director of Aladdin, uh, who said, you know, that they actually had a scene in mind um, with this being confirmed, basically. So, yeah, interesting one. Uh, but yeah, rest in peace, Robin Williams. Absolute fucking legend. Um, I'm not sure when he actually passed away. Yeah, he died quite, quite a lot after Aladdin. Nonetheless, I it's just so sad that we lost Robin Williams when we did. Um, and uh, yeah, he's just such a such an amazing guy, such a talented actor. But uh, rest in peace to him. Uh, not that you know the fact that he died lots after means anything. I was just interested as to how far ago he actually made Aladdin before like um before he died because i know he there was a second aladdin film uh and i don't think he played the genie in it but um i remember watching that on vhs at some point went to a place cabin where they had it on vhs anyway uh yeah it's an interesting one and just yeah pretty cool pretty nifty one child's is the thing so in the thing uh the thing is essentially a shape-shifting uh, monster, alien being that we don't actually know uh, the origins of. Uh, essentially, this theory is saying that because Childs, which is one of the, he's one of the main cast, main characters, uh, that is in the base that they're at, um, and that gets invaded by this this creature, um, because he's not present for most of the film or most of the climax i should say people think that he is the thing or that he is just another uh, manifestation of it or the other way around i don't see how he could be the thing if that makes sense because like are they saying that maybe he was uh, camouflaged as child's like the thing, like Childs never existed, or are they saying that at the end he is the thing? I don't, I don't know what they mean because surely it should be the thing is Childs, not the other way around. Does that make sense? But it's an interesting one because you know, obviously he's not, he's not present for most of the, most of the the climax of the film, the main, the main, you know, fight of the film. But. So, I, absolutely love the thing love the shining for that matter but um it's a great great film amazing theory but obviously like some people think and rightfully so because he's the only black character in the film you know it's a bit racist which i completely i completely understand i don't think it's racist really i think it's more just about i don't think it has anything to do with it but i can understand why people feel like that um yeah, interesting one, and definitely want to think about when when rewatching. Um, yeah, Dark Side of the Moon sinking. So the album by Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, which is one of my favorite albums of all time, one of the best albums of all time, actually syncs perfectly to a lot of films. One of the the most famous ones being uh, the wizard of oz for example when um brain damage is played uh it starts around the same time if of if only i had a brain which is kind of creepy and crazy and just the amount of synchronization there is is almost perfect in a way to, to the wizard of oz nonetheless producer alan parsons thought it was funny because uh when asked about it because the tapes weren't even available at the time of the album's release like there's like they'd basically have to go to the cinema at a some place that was playing it i suppose they could get it on film maybe but um yeah he thought it was funny because it was basically not possible to even do that and it would probably take a loads of work just to synchronize to an old film that i don't think they had 
a lot of uh, you know inspiration from with their albums um, but it's a very very interesting one very interesting one um, quite disturbing if you look into how perfectly synced they are um, and uh, I think it would be really interesting to just listen to the whole album with you know Wizard of Oz um, yeah really weird really weird one the Joker is a war vet so I think this was thir first uh, theorized by the user on Reddit, Invincible Invincible Elliot, or Invisible. Or at least that's like the, the, the main place I could find it at. Uh, and it's it basically sparks the idea that the Joker, which was played by the late Keith Ledger, also a legendary actor, rest in peace, is a war veteran. And it would actually make a lot of sense with a lot of the things from the film. And he basically says that because of his perfect planning and strategy from the heist at the beginning of the film to even the, the end of the film um, and how the system works uh, and just how good he is at planning things out and how perfect the timing is for everything. It's almost like rhythmic, especially at the, the heist at the beginning of the film when he leaves perfectly with all the other um, school buses. Things like that uh, are just too well planned for just, you know, uh, uh, an anarchist, uh, the, well, the greatest anarchist of all time, you know, uh, that he has to be a war veteran. And he, and he knows the system so well that it, all, it almost is clear that he's been a part of the system, right? That he's a part of the military, uh, which would which would make it, clear why he knows the system so well you know of government of uh, everything right uh and also he he's so perfect with the movement during the scene where uh the military are uh in the street and they're perfect they're they're uh, doing the the ritual the march thing i can't think of what it's called just at this moment um and they're doing the salutes and you know putting their guns up he perfectly uh, matches up to that and does it so uh, so perfectly and knows exactly when to to shoot the the uh, the or not shoot but reveal Bruce in in the in the window up in the building um, that it's like kind of like you know it, it's almost a genius and he is I think I think Joker and and just anything is just like almost a genius of like planning and a genius of anarchy and he's just so good uh at knowing timing and knowing when to do things and why and how that is it's just it can it goes to show how, why he's like the perfect uh, match against batman right to foil batman that he knows exactly how to twist things and how to shock batman um not just in the dark knight right in the comics he's always you know doing that um and he's always he's always one step ahead of batman in a way and and knows exactly how to pull his strings um and it's, it's just goes to show how perfect he is but uh, the origins of that are are clear you know that it, it could be a military uh, he could be military vet and we but we all know that joker has multiple choice uh origins you know if i were to have my origin if i were to reveal my origin it would be multiple choice right we know he's an unreliable narrator even in joker 2019 right we know he's unreliable we know that he basically can't be trusted in terms of his own origins so i think it's really really interesting that that could be the third multiple choice you know, I'm getting hyped just thinking about it. So it's, it's really cool. Um, you know, that could be his third multiple choice uh, uh, origin, right? But yes, yeah, definitely something to th really, really think about. Um, when, you know, when rewatching The Dark Knight for the 9,233rd freaking time, do you know what I mean? Because I've seen The Dark Knight. Um, I was actually talking to a good, good friend of mine, filmmaker uh, friend, very good friend of mine, and you know he, we were talking about how many times we'd watched The Dark Knight, 
and it's just like uh, especially when we were younger you you just when you didn't have anything to do you go i want to watch the dark knight again you know what i mean it's i don't know if anyone feels the same way but amazing film amazing film not my favorite batman film you know i think we all know we'll see but what my favorite and you can probably see the batman poster there actually i'm quite thirsty but yeah it's not my favorite batman film uh the batman uh is definitely my favorite but it's still an amazing film willy wonka is a killer have you ever found it weird that basically every child that goes along to the factory in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, I think the American version is called, um, dies? I mean, everyone but Charlie <laughs> dies. They, they're dead. They, they get murdered, basically. Or manslaughtered, whatever. Um, basically, this theory supposes or, or posits or says theorizes that Willy Wonka deliberately murders these kids kills these kids um basically tempting them uh with each of their their respective obsessions their respective uh goals I suppose you could say uh and and yeah obsessions with with uh whatever it is material goods you know food you know sort of gluttony there's there's you know every kid has their own their own sort of obsession same with the adult adults actually um and he's picking them off one by one based on their weaknesses because he knows their weaknesses um so yeah this this one's definitely got me thinking the most because it would kind of make sense why he does everything he does and why because he's he's mostly like a hermit from what I remember um and, and it makes sense why he's like kind of coming out of retirement or whatever just to do these things um and that's basically to give moral justice right uh and to kill these kids uh it's <laughs> I'm not getting monetized but I don't give a shit fuck you YouTube you fucking cunt um and I think it's really it's really interesting uh, because it just seems so deliberate and it just seems so meticulously planned and it, he's just quite quite the like uh uh uncaring person um and just very eccentric and and sort of morally justifies his own his own sort of you know slaves basically with the impalumpas and i think that um it's really interesting and it's it's almost like he's ridding the world of these terrible people and he's like making an example of them you could say um and it's just i just find it really interesting because it's almost like i don't know like a psychopath who it's like it's like an assassin who justifies every person he kills kind of thing and i always find those kind of characters really really interesting uh almost like kill bill in a way you know the bride from kill bill so yeah, it's really, really interesting one, and it's it's interesting how Charlie's the only one left over, and the reason he's left over is because he's a good person, and he doesn't have any moral weaknesses, you know, because he's not morally messed up, um, and he's in, and he's innocent, right? But the only question is like, why didn't he kill off all the adults as well, you know? Um, maybe to to he killed the kids just to leave them alive to teach them a lesson to go yeah that you you raise a bad kid and you're you're a horrible person i'm gonna kill your kid and leave you alive to 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 like morally torture you but that's really fucked up <laughs> um maybe that's maybe that's what it is i'm not sure but it's a really interesting one and i think that uh i don't know it's it's just crazy it's a crazy one but it, it kind of makes sense in a way uh, like a lot of these actually but yeah Boba Fett killed Owen and Baru. So, perhaps one of the most horrific scenes in the whole Star Wars saga, to even say, um, is the scene in which uh, uh, Uncle Owen and Aunt Baru are burnt to a crisp. Obviously off screen, but we see their charred remains just sitting on the porch um, in... in uh, on the porch in... Uh, Luke's home basically and their home 
in a new hope and i think it's just such a poignant uh turning point for for the whole saga because i mean that's when that's when luke knows he has to go into the resistance and become a rebel and uh that that's when he starts his journey to become a jedi and it's it's just such a big turning point and it's really it's a really interesting theory to think that boba fett did it uh and you know given given george lucas's you know meticulous uh planning of just the whole the whole trilogy in terms of you know uh everything lining up to the future events and uh sort of everything making sense with the characters and the world sort of joining together even though you know characters haven't been seen uh or like their intentions haven't been seen they just match up because he's you know planned it all out um is it, it would make sense it would make sense but it's actually been disproven because there's this book that came out is it, i can't think of what it's called but it was released in 2017 um i think it's called uh, uh something stories small stories or something i apologize for not having the source there um and it, it basically covers boba fett's timeline during the event uh or events and it's clear that vader told fett no disintegrations um so he could identify any remains you know if if he was going off and killing whoever vader told him to so he wouldn't have charred their bodies because he said no disintegrations uh so it's clear that it, it, it wasn't him or uh, it just doesn't wouldn't make sense or maybe he killed him and then some stormtroopers came along and were like we're bored and they charred their remains but then they'd get it just wouldn't make sense so um it, it clearly wasn't him uh or at least 90% it wasn't because Vader said that but either way it's it's a really cool Ked, Han he Ked Hannon <laughs> it's a really cool head cannon to sort of keep in mind because I mean who doesn't love Boba Fett and with you know Book of Boba Fett out now and just much more coverage of him which is amazing and the amazing actor who plays him now I can't think of his name I think it's Tamara or something really good actor that plays him uh really well and played uh Jango Fett as well it would it's just a very cool canon uh and it it's just really cool when you know original trilogy things sort of come back and sort of stream back to to other events um so yeah it's really cool really cool to think about and uh interesting one the shining is about indigenous genocide so we've already touched on the shining once uh and this one basically it, this one is almost certainly true uh there's so much indigenous art uh and symbolism throughout the film that it's it's crazy um it's an incredibly layered film the shining as we know uh with so many themes that can be extracted from it you know sort of insanity uh, the twin dilemma of like being two kinds of people um obviously abuse domestic abuse uh and all sorts of almost temporal incidents you know uh and just very very strange and off-putting incidents you know the bartender uh the scene in in the bathroom when uh, jack is talking to him obviously the infamous room 237 scenes multiple the red room scene just it's just such an iconic film and there are just so many different things you can pull from those and this is by far the most relevant one because it's literally has evidence throughout the film that's evident you know with all the indigenous art that's throughout you know the lobby even during uh the elevator scene there's indigenous art right next to the elevator doors right and the the blood is basically and i like to think this is the case for sure is the blood of all the indigenous people that died in its symbolism for colonialism and i think that adds so much to the film because the film has this airiness to it and this pace that's very very slow and it almost it's like one of the films that uh kubrick has done that is almost completely objective you know it's a very very objective experience of a film and you know obviously that infamous scene at the end 
her, which I think is almost like a temporal incident, a, a, a time traveling incident of Jack becoming or Jack is uh, the the colonialist in the the photo when I think the the overlook the hotel they're in uh, from 1921 was opening um, some people think he's a reincarnation of that of that version um, and it just it would make a lot of a lot of sense and obviously there's there's a lot of death symbolism of death murder you know the murder that could be red rum could be a reflection of the murder that happened there before with the colonialists murdering people the people of that land uh, and obviously the the death the death showing up the skeletons showing up or the dead members of what i think is the hotel and you know i it, it, the only thing is it, it wouldn't really explain the strange nature of you know the scene with that that big uh, bear furry um and i think uh, that that's the only thing that's really not discovered i also think come to think of it you know more filmmakers need to come and think of talking about animals need to respect animals more in the film industry like it's an essential animal cruelty is horrible in this industry so talk about it and it's just absolutely horrible i've done a lot of uh, research on that um and I'm sure Kubrick was a part of that, just because he was uh, he just didn't care about anything but his films. I think we all know that, given the abuses he's done to his actors. So I would be very surprised if he didn't have a huge part of that. But I don't mean not to speak ill of the dead, but it's probably true. And we can learn from it by not doing that, you know, by by not having animal cruelty. But anyway, talk about that. Be a part of 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 being against that because people don't talk about it nearly nearly enough uh anyway yeah that that scene wouldn't make much sense but i suppose that could be symbolized in a lot of ways and that could have a deeper meaning too um for which i can't think of right now but it's a very very interesting theory um and i just i just think that it it gives so much more to the film and it gives so much more relevance to the film uh and we can still take things from it today you know the indigenous people are still not being treated well obviously and um we can still take things from that you know we can still take themes from that we can still take lessons from that uh and i think it i know for sure going back watching the shining which i think i will do soon it's gonna be something that's definitely on my mind uh, which is really cool Anyway, that is the first layer completely done. I'm going to be uh, chopping this, uh, almost said a film, this video into parts. Um, uh, so this is the first part being the first tier. Uh, and then the next part will be the second tier and so on. And there's six tiers. So it'll be six parts to this series. And then I'll do a, a uh, big, collection video uh, like Wendigoon has done with his and many many uh, many people have done um, so that you can watch all of it without the intros like the entire thing but anyway this has been amazing uh, really fun I'm really enjoying this I've really enjoyed this and I just hope you guys really enjoyed it um, thank you so much for the support on everything my films and everything I've had some really kind comments and just a lot of support and i really really do appreciate it from the bottom of my heart uh yeah go and check out my films that are on this channel uh and just uh, check out you know check out my stuff to stay updated you know uh, i'm quite uh active on youtube to, to update people on my films and where they are and everything um if you if you enjoyed this if you enjoy films indie films uh, in general and just films in general because I'm a big film fan which means my films will reflect that but uh, and and my videos um, so yeah I hope you enjoyed take care of yourselves take care of each other uh, and I'll see you neon hunting